All right. So we are done with the introduction to the audit. The first chapter we started was introduction to the audit. And then we studied the ethics. Afterwards, we went towards the corporate governance. And the last thing we did was the internal audit. So according to my sequence, you have done four chapters. Introduction to the audit, ethics, corporate governance, and internal audit. Okay, introduction to audit was related to the definition of the audit and assurance, levels of assurance. Ethics was related to the ethical acceptance, fundamental principles, ethical threats. And then, and again, that thing was associated uh, with the pre-acceptance things. Then we studied the corporate governance, the compliance thing, and then we discussed the internal audit, which is the difference between the internal and the external audit. Now we'll be moving towards the practical auditing and the first stage of the audit cycle, which is audit planning. We have already discussed the audit cycle and the first stage of the audit cycle is audit planning. And then it is being followed by the assessment of client's internal control system, assessment of client's internal control system. And once we have assessed the system, either it is going to be strong or weak. Now, how would we know that the system is strong? Obviously, we are going to test it. We are going to evaluate the system. And if the system is strong, we will be doing less substantive testing. And we have already discussed this concept that if the system is strong, then the figures are reliable. The figures coming from the system into the financial statements are reliable. And as a result, you will be doing less substantive testing. That means you would be testing the financial statements, but in a lesser portion, less substantive testing. And if the system is weak, then the figures are not reliable. And as a result, you have to do detailed testing or detailed substantive testing. Once we are done with the substantive testing, detailed or less, then there will be the review, review stage. And the last stage is going to be the report in which we are going to hand over the report related to the audit to the shareholders. So this is the audit cycle. We have already discussed this thing. Now, there are two types of audit procedures involved in this complete testing. First of all, we were assessing the client's internal control system. And these audit procedures are known as the test of controls. We are testing their controls, testing the client's internal control system. So that these are known as TOCs, test of controls. So with the help of the test of controls, now the test of controls means the audit procedures which are being used to test the client system simply. So with the help of the test of controls, we were evaluating whether the system of the client is strong or weak. Once we have established that, then we will be doing the substantive testing. Now this substantive testing is actually less or detailed. Less testing when the system is strong, detailed testing when the system is weak. Again, the substantive testing means the testing on the financial statements. First, we did the testing on the system, and then we did the testing on the financial statements, the statement of profit and loss, statement of financial position, notes to the financial statements, cash flows, the changes in equity. Then we have the review, and the last stage is the report. So this is the audit cycle right in front of you, practical auditing. And now we are starting the first stage of the audit cycle, which is audit planning. And you can see that this, at this stage of the audit, which is audit planning, we do not have anything in relation to the financial statements. Now, what does this mean? Look, there are so many things we have to do within this audit. You can see the cycle. First of all, we have to do the planning then we have to assess the client's internal control system. Then we have to perform the substantive testing. Then there's a review stage. At the last stage, we have to write up the report or draft the report. So there are so many things which we have to do within this audit activity. 
we cannot do all these things by the end of the year or after the year. So that means we have to split our work within two stages. So usually these two stages, the audit planning and the assessment of client's internal control system, these two things are done before the year end. These two things, which is the audit planning, that how we'll be doing the audit, what is going to be our strategy, what is, our, what is going to be our plan, how many resources we are going to deploy, and all those things. And similarly, the assessment of client's internal control system, because system is there, you do not have to wait for the financial statement in order to test the system. System is something independent of the financial statements. The, the, you do not have to wait for the financial statements in order to test the system. So these two things, which is the audit planning and the assessment of the client's internal control system, these two activities are usually done before the year end. And this is known as the interim audit. And for these two activities, the audit planning and the assessment of client's internal control system, we do not have to wait for the financial statements. And then rest of, rest of the things which is which involves substantive testing which involves report review everything these stages these are done after the year end once we have the financial statements and this is known as the final audit so the complete audit process is being divided into two stages the things we do before the year end, which is audit planning and the assessment of internal control system mainly. And this is known as the interim audit. And then we have the things which we do at or after the year end. That is the substantive testing review and the report that is known as the final audit. All right, so when, we, when it comes to the audit planning, when we are discussing the audit planning thing, remember, that there are certain things which we'll be doing at this stage. And one of the main activity the auditor is going to perform at this stage is understanding the entity. Understanding the entity. Now understanding the entity means we are going to take the detailed understanding of the audit client detailed understanding of the audit client detailed understanding of the audit client this is the first thing we are going to do understanding the entity and the other thing which is associated with the understanding of the entity is the risk assessment risk assessment so the two things understanding the entity and the risk assessment now we have to develop we have to establish the link between these two now before doing that let comes let's go discuss the uh, the objective of the external audit which we have already discussed in the chapter number one objective of external audit So we have already discussed that in the external audit, the auditor is supposed to provide the reasonable assurance, the high level confidence to the shareholders regarding what? That whether the financial statements are free from material misstatements. whether due to fraud or error and the second thing is the financial statements are prepared in accordance with relevant financial reporting framework. So in the external audit, the auditor is supposed to give the assurance. The auditor is supposed to give the assurance, which type of assurance? 
the reasonable assurance, the high level, the high level confidence to the shareholders that whether or not the financial statements are free from material misstatement. And we, when we say material, we know it means significant. And when we say misstatement, it is anything which is not according to the standard. For example, if inventory is not according, is recorded according to the IS2, that, is, that means the lower of cost or NRV, that means inventory is misstated. If the revenue expenditure is not expensed out instead capitalized, then we're gonna say it's misstated. Misstatement is anything which is not according to the standard. So we have to give the reasonable assurance to the shareholders whether or not the financial statements are free from material misstatement, whether due to fraud or error, and they are prepared in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework. This is the assurance we are supposed to provide to the shareholders. Now, why the shareholders are hiring us to review the financial statements or to audit the financial statements? Because shareholders are sitting outside the organization, they were not involved in running the company. The directors were running the company. They were having the control of everything and they have prepared the financial statements and the shareholders lack the trust over the directors. So they have in their mind that the directors may manipulate the financial statements. The directors may do the window dressing. They may do the creative accounting. They may not show the actual performance and position of the company. So this is the doubt that the shareholder is having in their mind. That is why they need an independent person in the form of the external auditor who has nothing to do with the company in terms of business, in terms of all those activities. He doesn't have any sort of business relationship, family relationship, long-standing relationship with the client and the directors and the management. And he's completely independent. So he will be checking those financial statements. And he will be giving the opinion to the shareholders whether or not the financial statements are free from material misstatement. And whether the financial statements are prepared in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework. So that means when the shareholders have this thing in their mind that the financial statements may be materially misstated, the financial statements may have the manipulations, they may have the window dressing, they may have the creative accounting, they may not show the actual performance and position of the company. So we are concerned regarding that particular thing. And whenever we are going to do the audit, there are two risks within the financial state, two risks when performing the audit, two risks while performing the audit. Two risks while performing the audit. The first one, financial statements may contain material misstatements. There may be material errors, there may be material omissions, and we know material is something which can affect the decision of the user of the financial statements. So whenever we are doing the audit of the financial statements, there are two risks. The first risk is the financial statements may contain may have the material misstatements in it. That is why the shareholders are hiring us to perform the audit. If they are sure that everything is fine, why they will be hiring us? Obviously the concept of the audit started where the directors uh, started you know, betraying the shareholders by preparing the manipulated, the fi manipulated financial statements. So financial statements may contain material misstatements. We have to keep this thing in our mind. We have to be skeptical. We have to be alert that whenever we are performing the audit, the financial statements may contain the material misstatements. Because if we are quite sure that everything will be fine, we won't be able to detect anything over there. So that is why we should be concerned regarding this. And we should have this thing in our mind that the financial statements may contain the material misstatements. Now the second risk. The second risk is that the auditor may not detect the material misstatements. So the first thing was concerned with the financial statements. And the second thing is concerned with the auditor itself. Financial statements may contain material misstatement. Now, obviously we cannot fix this risk because we have not prepared the financial statements. We have studied this thing in ethics that this is the precondition 
that the financial statements are going to be prepared by the management, by the directors. It is their responsibility to prepare the financial statements. So as long as they are preparing the financial statement, there will remain this risk that the financial statements may have the material misstatement. So this risk cannot be eliminated unless and until the auditor start himself preparing the financial statements, which is not possible. So financial statements may contain the material misstatement. Now this is the first risk. The second risk is that the auditor may not able to detect the material misstatements. Auditor may not detect the misstatements. Now, what if there are material misstatements in the financial statements and they remain undetected by the auditor? Let's assume I'm doing the audit. There were material misstatements within the financial statements and I didn't detect that. And when the shareholders will be asking me, okay, how's the financial statements? And I'll be saying, everything is fine. Financial statements are free from material misstatement. And do you think my opinion will be right? No, absolutely wrong. Because there were risk over there, there were material misstatements over there, and you were not able to identify that. So if there are material misstatements in the, within the financial statements, and if the auditor is not able to detect them, then the auditor may give the incorrect audit opinion. That means as a result, financial statements may contain the material misstatements. The auditor may not detect the material misstatements. So if the auditor is not able to detect the material misstatements, auditor may give the incorrect audit opinion and this concept is known as the audit risk. This is known as the audit risk. That means the risk in the audit is that the auditor may give the incorrect opinion. Now you see everywhere, when everywhere I have used the term may, may, may. Because when we say risk, a risk is something which is likely to occur. There, there are chances that the financial statements may have the material misstatement. There are chances that the auditor may not detect material misstatement. There are chances that the auditor may give the incorrect opinion. So that is why we are using the term may. I cannot say the auditor will give the incorrect opinion because I'm not sure we are the auditor ourselves. So there's a risk in the audit that the auditor may give the incorrect opinion. Now, if the auditor give the, gives the incorrect opinion, this is going to be a huge negligence on his part. And the client is going to sue them for their professional negligence that you were not able to find the material misstatements. How would you give this opinion? So there's going to be a huge negligence on the auditors and if they are giving the incorrect opinion. So this is a significant thing for us. We cannot afford to give audit, incorrect audit opinion. We cannot afford to have the audit risk thing. So that means we have to put some efforts. We have to put some efforts to reduce this risk. Now, in order to reduce this risk, see where from where this risk is coming from. From where this risk is coming from. The first thing is that the financial statements may contain the material misstatements. And I told you that it is not possible for us to eliminate this risk. Financial statements may contain the material misstatement. That means there may be risk within the statement of financial position. What we have in the statement of financial position? Assets, assets may be overstated. Liabilities, liabilities may be understated. What we have in the statement of profit or loss? Revenue, income. Revenue may be overstated. We have profit, profit may be overstated. We have expenses, expenses may be understated. What do we have other than that? Notes, in the notes we have to perform the disclosures. Disclosures may not be provided appropriately. So, 
financial statements may contain the material misstatement. Now, what we can do regarding this? We cannot eliminate this risk, first of all. Just keep this thing in your mind. We cannot eliminate this financial statement risk that there may be material misstatement within the financial statements. Now, what we can do is take the detailed understanding of the entity. Detail, detailed understanding of the entity. And with the help of the detailed understanding of the entity, just try to understand what sort of transactions are there within the financial statements. And at the planning stage of the audit, identify the risk of the material misstatement. Listen again, what we're gonna do is take the detailed understanding of the entity. When we say detailed understanding, so we have to understand the industry, in which industry they are operating, we have to understand their products. We have to understand their services. We have to understand their offers. We have to understand their prices, their major customers, their major payables, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to take the detailed understanding of the entity. And once we are taking the detailed understanding of the entity, thereby we are going to identify the risk of material misstatement. Risk of material misstatement. What are those things within the financial statements that may be materially misstated? When we say, Maybe, then that means we are not sure. Because we are just at the planning stage of the audit, we do not have the financial statements yet. Let me give you an example. So we have to take the detailed understanding of the entity and then in relation to that, we will be identifying the risk of material misstatement, how these two things are connected. Let me give you an example. So you're auditing a company, name of the company is let's assume ABC company. And what does this company do? They are mobile phone manufacturers, mobile phones, they sell mobile phones, right? And when you were taking the understanding of the entity, you ask them, okay, you sell the mobile phone. They say, yes, we sell the mobile phones. Okay, fine. Can you please tell me, do you offer, do you offer the warranty? Because we know that usually when we buy the mobile phone, there is uh, attached warranty to it, like one year, two year, things like that. Do you offer warranty? And they said, yes, we offer one year warranty. And then I asked, okay, what is about that? He's, they said, okay, it's about if there will be problems, either we are going to repair it or we are going to replace it. like we will be giving the new phone instead i said okay so you will be giving the new phone instead so either we are going to repair it or we are going to replace the phone that means giving the new phone to the customer and then i asked him okay how many chances are there that the phone will be coming for repairs they said if we have sold 100 percent phones two percent of them will be coming for the repairs and one person of them will be coming for the replacement. Okay, fine. Now this is the information which I have taken from them while taking the understanding of the entity. Like what you sell mobile phones, do you offer warranty? Yes. For how many years? One year. What is the, what is the warranty about? Repair or the replacement. And then the percentage, is this, they told us. Now we know that when the phones will be coming for the repair. It is their present obligation to fix it. When the phone will be coming for replacement, it is their present obligation as a result of past event to fix it. And there will be an expected outflow 
when they are going to settle those things. And that outflow can be reliably measured as well because they know how much it costs to repair, how much it costs to replace. So according to IAS 37, provision should be recorded if the outflow is probable. There is a risk that provision may not be recorded or recorded at incorrect amounts resulting in the understatement of expenses or you can say expense and liabilities expenses and liabilities because if the provision is not recorded then there is no expense and there is no liability so according to IS 37 provision should be recorded if the outflow is probable there is a risk that provision may not be recorded or recorded at incorrect amounts and as a result expenses and liabilities may be understated now we don't know whether they have recorded it, whether they have recorded at the correct amounts, but we will be pre preparing a list of audit risks, financial statement risk. Okay, we're gonna make a list. Okay, when we go to the testing stage, the, st the testing of the financial statements, the substantive thing, we have to check whether they have recorded a provision, correct provision according to IS 37. Now at this stage of the audit, what we are doing, we are keeping in our mind that these are the certain areas which are at high risk. And as a result, we have to give certain, we have to give appropriate consideration to these areas. So that is why we are making a list of those areas which may have the material misstatements in it. We are never sure. Maybe they have recorded the correct amounts in a provision. That will be fine if we see that. But right now, we are identifying the risk of the material misstatement. Similarly, the same mobile company. Okay. Then you ask them, okay, you're a mobile phone company. Obviously, you need to launch new phones into the market every time. So, for example, when you have the new model into the market, what do you do with the old ones? Old ones, the old phones. They say we significantly we significantly reduce the price of old phones. This is what they said. When the new model come to the market, we significantly reduce the price of the old phones. Okay, I said yes. Okay, fine. So we know that phones are their inventory. And significantly means they will be reducing the price too much. And according to IS2, Inventory should be recorded at lower of cost or NRV. According to IS2, inventory should be recorded at lower of cost or NRV. There's a risk that old phones may not be written down to NRV and as a result assets and profits may be overstated. Because if they have significantly reduced the price of the phones, maybe the NRV is lower than the cost, then they have to bring the phones to the NRV, which is the lower value. There's a risk that it is still recorded at cost rather than NRV. 
and as a result inventory may be overstated and again you will be going back to your list and you will be writing the point over here that we have to check the nrv thing as well now maybe they have recorded the phones at the correct amounts but right now what we are doing we are keeping the risk in our mind that the inventory may be misstated because if we are not being skeptical if we are not alert to these things then maybe it is possible we are not able to detect these things as well and as a result we'll be giving the incorrect opinion okay let me give you another example the same mobile phone company okay they say that we have spent a huge amount this year on the research and development and i said how much amount they said 5 billion dollars now we know according to is 38 research cost should be expensed out and development should be capitalized if the criteria is met there is a risk that expenses may be misclassified that means they may have capitalized the research or they may have capitalized the development even if the criteria is not met there's a risk that expenses may be misclassified and as a result assets and profits may be under slash overstated now you see they told us regarding the research and development when we were taking the understanding of the entity and we linked it to the risk that may be in the financial statements and we are going to write that thing in our list that okay once we are doing the detailed testing we have to check the research research and development thing as well maybe they have recorded the research and development on the correct amounts and they have done the correct accounting treatment but again we are not sure that is why this is a risk financial statement risk risk of material misstatement so once we are taking the understanding of the entity we will be identifying the risk of material misstatements and we'll be making a list within uh, the audit file that okay these are the risks that we identify during the planning stage of the audit and when we go to the testing stage when we go to the testing stage we have to confirm these things within the financial statements so you see what we are doing is we are taking the detail understanding of the entity and we are identifying the relevant risk associated with that there are a lot of examples i can give to you for example again the same mobile company i asked them okay do you sell only on cash they say no 50% of the sales are made on cash and 50% of them are on installments the plans being given to the customers they pay monthly installments for it and then i ask okay do all customers pay they say no they are bad debts sometimes now when they told me this thing i brought that thing in in my mind that okay receivables is the receivables are there significant amount of receivables because 50% are say 50% of sales are made on on credit receivables are subject to the bad debts and they are saying there are bad debts sometimes so as a result they have to create an allowance for receivables for the doubtful debts if the allowance for receivables is not created receivables may be overstated maybe they have created but i but i do not have the idea regarding that so i'll be making a list of the risk of the material misstatement so summarizing it that what we are doing we are taking the detail understanding of the entity and thereby we are identifying the risk of the material misstatements planning stage is all about taking the detail understanding of the entity developing your audit strategy developing your audit plan and identifying the risk of the material misstatement
So what we're going to do with these risks when we go to the testing stage, we'll be confirming these things. We'll be getting the evidence on research and development, NREs, provisions to confirm whether they are recorded correctly or they have some material misstatements in it. So with the help of this activity, we will be able to reduce the audit risk, that the risk that the auditor may give the incorrect opinion. Now, because we are thoroughly checking the financial statements, we are thoroughly doing the risk assessment, ultimately the risk of incorrect opinion being given will be reduced. So by taking the detailed understanding of the entity, we will be able to identify the areas which may have the material misstatements in it. Accordingly, we will be conducting the testing on those risks and then we'll be having an evidence to give the opinion. And once we are having the evidence, the risk of incorrect opinion being given will be reduced. So this is the linkage of getting the detailed understanding of the entity and identifying the risk of material misstatements. And this is going to help the auditor to reduce the level of the audit risk, to reduce the chances of giving the incorrect audit opinion.